and we went to uh, went to Greenwich High School, Greenwich. And now you, you graduated from Greenwich. Yes. Now, um, your mom and dad. Um, can you give me their names? My mother's name was Lillian. Her maiden name? Maiden name was Nee Jane. And my father's name was A S S I E D, Asad Toma. His middle name was Salim. And they uh, they came over from from Lebanon. From Lebanon. From Lebanon, yes. And to the states, and and ended up in Connecticut. Right. Now, do you have any brothers or sisters? I have uh, two two sisters and one brother. And, and their names? One's uh, Elizabeth Elizabeth Smith. She passed away. My older sister, my youngest sister, is Genevieve Haddad, and she's still living. She's a couple of years younger than I am. And my brother, who was a couple of years younger than me, he passed away a few years ago. He used to work for the Southington uh, School. And um, at, at the time of their deaths, were they living in Southington? Or? Yes. Okay. And um, when you graduated, from, you graduated from Greenwich High School in Greenwich. Right. And um, were you drafted? No, I enlisted. You enlisted. Was it right after high school? Right. Yeah, yeah. No, not right after high school. I went to work for a company in Mamaroneck, New York, an instrument company. They were making their airplane de-ices for the wing. And the boss told me he can get me deferred. I said, no, I want to be a hero. So I enlisted in White Plains, New York, to be in the Navy, to be a, an aerial photographer, and they rejected me because I had flat feet. Now you figure that one out. What flat feet got to do with the airplane? And yeah. what happened after that? And Once that, you got rejected? Well, I, I got rejected from being an airplane photographer, but then I went ahead and enlisted in the regular Navy. And when was that? Navy Reserve. November 28, 1942. And um, you shipped out shortly thereafter? Or? No, I spent some, did a lot of training in the States, down to Florida, up to Nova Scotia. From Nova Scotia, we went to a big thousand fleet convoy before June 6th. And the whole fleet went for that invasion. And where was this invasion? In, in uh, Normandy. Normandy. Um, can you give us a little history about the invasion? Well, I wasn't in the invasion. It took a lot of fellas, and they, uh, we were in a reserve section. We, they put me on an LST. The name of the ship was, was an LST-50, the number. And we had davits, six davits on the ship, and uh, one of them held my boat called the landing barge, a LCVP. It was in the amphibious corps. And uh, the number of my boat was 34. George, you indicated that you went into the Navy. Um, I enlisted in you, you, you enlisted. Why the Navy? I love the water. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you ever get seasick? When you... Well, uh, no. No? No, I got seasick as I got older. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but not while you were in the Navy? No. no. Um, now, when you went in and you took basic training, where did you go to basic training? Samson, New York. And what was there? What, uh, was there? what was the base? Or... Well, it was all regular training for the Navy. And then, then they put me into the uh, amphibious amphibious corps, which was which means uh, land or sea. Uh, so they put us on landing barges. It's not a barge; it's a boat, thirty-six foot Higgins boat. They called them those days. And then we'd go out to big ships. We trained in Florida, Fort Pierce, Florida. 
in the training, we'd take our boats up to big ships, load them up with troops, and bring them to the beaches, wherever they directed us to go. Now, were you nervous when you first went in? Not quite, no. No, I'd be honest with you. I got nervous as I went in deeper and deeper into the service, yeah. But um, now, how was the, um, what they call the Brotherhood, the group of guys you were with? Oh, there was, well, from all states. Did you go any with anybody from uh, that you knew growing up, growing up from Southington? or No, no. I, I met a whole new flock of new men. you recall anybody from your boot camp time? Yes, we had meetings. We got together at times. Call them up and uh, we'd have a go out and have a good time. Yeah, and on my boat we had four four man crew. I was a diesel mechanic, which there was nothing to do, just listen to the diesel engine on it. And uh, there was a signalman and a gunner and a coxman who drove the boat. And uh, and a gunner. Now, where did you go after New York, after your training? Where did I go after New York? I was shipped to, I was shipped to Fort Pierce, Florida, to train for the landing parties. How long were you down there? When was that? When you first went in, 42? Yeah, 42, 43, yeah. Beginning of 43. We were down in Fort Pierce, Florida, learning how to handle the landing barges. Then what? What you do after that? Then from there, we were assigned to a, a ship that carried the landing barges on davits, big davits. So they put us on LST-50, that's landing ships tanks. So I went across the North Atlantic with an LSC-15 that's over 300 feet long, but there was no keel. It was like a floating bathtub. So you're getting whacked with waves and oh my God, tossing and turning? I had the telephone poles. There were 30-foot waves or more. Very seldom you see a calm sea. We got near Scotland, then the sea started to flatten out. The closer we got to the Germans, the submarines, the sea calmed out, but they couldn't hit us anywhere because we didn't draw much water. Mm. And these LSTs, they go up on the beaches also, and so they couldn't draw much water. And they delivered all the stuff that the soldiers needed. But we didn't go on the Normandy beachhead. We were shoved, our crew was shoved up to La Havre, France, north of all the beaches that were here. So we weren't in the uh, Normandy invasion, but we came in later when they asked for special services to go to a special destination without knowing where to go, they're going, and we were looking for volunteers, that's what they were telling us. So we were in England and they picked us out and we volunteered to go to this place we didn't know where we were going. So it happened to be on the Rhine River. We were the first Navy in history to go so far inland. And when we got to the Rhine River, then we got there, then we found out what we were there for, to help the Army Corps engineers build the pontoon bridges, because all those bridges were getting bombed out at the original bridges that crossed the Rhine. And there were the the Germans were in the castles on the other side shooting down at us. So we brought a fellow from the 1st Army, 1st Division, with us on our boat, and he laid a smoke screen. So the people that were shooting at us from the, from the uh, castles, they didn't know where they were shooting at. They couldn't track our boats again, only by the noise. Then my Coxman, who was the captain of the boat who took care of the helm, started to go to the right. I said, Mac, you're going the wrong way. You're going into the enemy. He can't see where he's going. But I don't know why, but I did it. I 
took a chance to get in the court, watch it. I took him away from his helm and I went the opposite way. I saved the whole crew. Otherwise, we would have been knocked right down before we hit their beach. Now, what was up or said about that? Well, he was headed east. I wanted to go west. But, I mean, was it, were you recognized for doing something no, so, so great? No, he could have turned me in and I could have been court-martialed for disobeying orders. But to me, an order is if it's all right. And if it's a right order, and who am I to say if it's the right order? My instincts. Yeah. So I take the whole crew, I think. So what happened after that? Where uh, after that you got that you got that um, we put the pontoon bridges up on the Rhine. Help we didn't do it all. We had help with the Army Corps engineers. See they had Rowboats with outboard motors trying to fight a current that was a 15 knot current on the Rhine. And instead of putting the pontoon together attached to another one, they were going the opposite way. And that river ran upstream down north, down north, not south. It came from the Alps all the way on the float out to the North Sea. Well, there was a lot of stories. Before we got there, anyway, there was a section in Aachen where we went. We put our boats on trailers, low boy trailers, and there was a section there where the Germans wet the road that we were on, made it very muddy to slow us down for our advancement. That's when we were trapped around the bulge in Aachen, but so, we got out of it. So you were. Was a battle of the bulge going on at the time that just about over, just about over. But it was still going on. It was still going on, yes. And uh, while we were six months in Germany, there on the Rhine, we were living right near the river in one of the homes that the civilians had to evacuate. And what what uh, what town was it? In this is Bad Gottesburg. I got it and in uh, Romagen. That's the name of another. There's a bridge called the Romagen Bridge. How were the people over there? Well, we, we, we saw some people, but not many, because we sent flyers down from the airplanes to evacuate. We're coming through. We're keeping this, this town secured. Did you ever hear about, uh, I mean, they would send propaganda stuff down, um, the Americans. They would, uh, I know that there was information about that Southington was in. You know, um, it was supposed to be in a propaganda thing about the schools, uh, the work, and about the American people and how great it was, democracy. And supposedly that was dropped over in Germany. Um, but... Um, but, I mean, you acknowledge that there was stuff being dropped from, from airplanes. Well, I'll it, tell you what I do know about what was being dropped from airplanes. The Germans dressed up a few of their men into American uniforms, and they dropped those soldiers that were Nazis with parachutes, but you'd stop them on a road after they land, and then they knew the password to pass. But they didn't know one thing. That's how we caught them. Like, who won the World Series? <laughs> or how did Dick Tracy make out? They never read the funny papers. But Dick Tracy, they didn't know. It. That's how we tracked them. But they spoke damn good English. Now, was there, was there uh, many of these people that were... <laughs> yes, yes. There was quite a few soldiers caught. And that was around the bulge, too. And around Hawking. Yeah, they were coming down from all over there for a while. But we caught them, even though they knew the password. Now, what's, um, did you have any uh, memorable experiences uh, during this time? I'm sure there's a lot of things that, that uh, you I remember, remember some that you don't, but, but uh, you know, guys that you were, you were with. Um, yeah. Do you play any practical jokes on? Oh, my God. Huh? Well, I'll tell you another one. Sorry. 
I don't like to stand guard in the night when the Nazis are around your neighborhood. So they put me on night duty to watch the, the barracks, you know. No smoking, and I was smoking like a fiend then. <laughs> couldn't light a match, couldn't do anything. Or no cigarette. So we were in this pitch dark area around this big house that we stayed at. And I was standing, the, I think it was a two to four watch, two hour watch in the night. And I'm thinking of this guy coming behind me with the two, two handles and a wire in between and swinging it around my neck. And I'm scared shit. Excuse my English. <laughs> so that's what I was thinking of. And then he called me to go to go on and watch again. I said, could I see the officer, please? <laughs> well, you were a young kid then. How old yeah, were you right. about? Oh, I must have been about 20, 19 or 20. Something like that. I don't remember. Yeah, you were a young kid in war. and uh... So the officer I spoke to, he says, oh, by the way, George, G.G. Keene, fellow from Brooklyn, said that you were into photography. And when I was a kid, I started developing pictures, 25 cents a roll, any size. I was learning. He, he says, and the officer says, I heard that your G.G. Keene said you used to do photography work in, in civilian life. I said, yeah, I did some. He said, how'd you like to change from the shift of night watching to uh, showing movies for the boys? I'd love it. Let me have it. So he gave me a Jeep, gave me two projectors, Bell and Hall projectors, and he gave me the rights to go to the entertainment center where Mickey Rooney was, Marlene Dietrich and Bobby Green and all those fellows. I met them all. And at the Jepson CP was called. And uh, <laughs> so I took over the movie control. So I got out of the night watching. I was scared. I didn't, I didn't like it. Well, that was great, huh? Yeah, and so he gave me my own power, the generator, and we rented, a, not rented, we took over an old theater that was abandoned, and I showed movies there. <laughs> and when I'm changing reels, all my buddies would stamp on the floor, change the reel, it's gone, it's gone, you know. <laughs> now, do you remember any of the movies? Oh, uh, yeah, one of them, the first one was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. That was the first one to show in Europe. Yeah, I remember that. And, uh, there was others too. Well, Fred is there dancing, stuff like that. How often did the guys get to see movies? Well, not too often. Maybe, maybe once a week, something like that. Now, how was the food? Food was all tough. It was tough. Were you rations? Rations, yeah. Yeah. You ever get any hot meals? We had filet mignon on Christmas. Oh, is that right? But you know how we got it. My buddy from, from Macon, Georgia, R.E.R., -E -R, Robert E. Robinson. He found an axe. So he went to a farm. <laughs> That's how we got it. I don't want to dare say it, <laughs> but he came back dragging the filet mignon. Oh, that was great. Eat. Huh? I'm sure the farmer wasn't happy, huh? He said, Mangia Salvatore. <laughs> now, how many, um, any guys come to mind that um, that were close to you? And... Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a fellow that lives in Wallingford. I don't know if he's still alive. I haven't seen or heard him quite a few years. He was in our outfit. Zeke, nice kid. I haven't seen him. We used to get together here. Well, he used to come over here. Yeah, mm -hmm. visit. Then we had a the, the fellow that used to drive our landing barge. He lived up in Norwood, Massachusetts, Tom McCullough, and uh, and he lived up. We went up to visit him one time, and the World Series was going on. Yeah, I don't know anything about baseball. I just love to fish. You know? So I went with the boys and we went up to see McCullough. 
and everybody up in Norwood Mass was interested in the Boston team, you know, the Red Sox. So I was in the on the bar having our beers. I took a quarter and put it in a jukebox. The bartender, who the hell put that jukebox on? It's lit. I put the quarter in. I want my quarter back. He goes over and pulled, pulled the plug out on me. Why well, you don't know want the jukebox playing? To listen to the baseball game oh. on, the, on the television. <laughs> Everybody had the attention on the television. What I know about that baseball. Now, as, um, <laughs> as far as medals and citations, um, I'm sure you got a few of them, huh? Well, no, I didn't have a few of them. I was uh, a naughty boy there for a while. I mean, some of these, um, you know, some I had two, two stars, two battle stars, that's it. That was enough. What did you do to pass the time over there, you know, while you were in? Well, not much to do. Now, did you ever come home? I mean, uh, how long did you spend over there before you came home? I spent six months in Germany. Six months? Yeah. Oh, the rest of the time was in England. Were you getting letters from home and packages? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, your mom and dad were alive at that time? Yes, yeah. they had a grocery store in Portchester, in New York, East Portchester, Connecticut, rather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, when you came home after the, uh, after the war, well, let, let, let me go back a little bit. What did you think when they bombed Pearl Harbor? Oh, I was choked up. I can't tell you how we felt. I, had it in my head. I can't give it to you in words. I wasn't there. But you were over in Germany at the yeah. time? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I was in uh, Germany. I was in England. England at the time? Yeah, yeah. No, I was in England. We were there for 11 months. So after the United States went over and bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What did you think? What did you, the guys think at that time when you... I don't know what the guys think, what the thought, rather. I didn't like it. I scared. I thought I was going to go over there after this. I got as far as California and I stopped. I didn't go. So you came back from England and you were getting shipped out to California? I stayed, I stayed in Southern for a leave. Yes. I think it was two weeks leave with the family. Then we were shipped from here by train, the old steam train, all the way across country to San Francisco. And I was shipped there, and then they, then they put me, no, no, I had to get some dental work done because I had an accident in Lyre, France. I lost my teeth here. I had wood up to my ear. But it has nothing to do with the battle, with my stupidness. I, sl I was watching boats on the docks in the nighttime so that they're tied to the dock. And there's this 35 foot tide there in La Haye, France. And I'm watching the boats so there's nobody, nobody to fool around with them or, or they didn't drift away. So the tide was out, easy 35 feet tide there. So here I'm walking on the dock, no lights. I'm still walking, I'm walking on air. I thought I was on the dock. And my buddy from the Britain, Joe Zellick, he says, where are you, Tuma? <laughs> Not even the water. I hit the corner of my boat with my face. Oh, so a wood went through here, the sky here, yeah. Sky here, and the wood went through here on the, from the boat, and the corner of the boat. And uh, he, he flew down the ladder, and got to me, picked me out of the water, and took me to a ship, a big Liberty ship, where it had uh, a big cross on it, a red cross like. And they said, no, we can't treat him here. you got to go to the other ship. 
you know, only treating the dying ones. So uh, it, he took me to another ship. We left that post. Uh, he could have got uh, court martial for that. Super law sometimes. Well, anyway, he took me to another ship with a bunch of nuns in there, and they packed it with sulfur. They wanted to take a piece of my butt and graft it. He said, no, you leave my butt alone. Just put the sulfur pack, and I want to go back to my outfit. My outfit went ahead of me. So I had to catch up with him. So I caught up with him. Now, where did they go? On the Ryan. We're going to the Ryan River. Oh, the Ryan River. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm talking about California. When you were shipped out to California, after you took your two right. weeks leave home, you ended up getting a... California, but so, my crew ended up in Korea. Oh, Korea. So you were over I, Korea? I was, no, I was ready to go there, but until I told them about my teeth, and I had a dental work to be done. I didn't have any dental work. I didn't want to go no more. Yeah. So that's the cowardness in me. No, that's not coward. You did. You, you served time in the military. You've done your duty. Um, the country is very proud of you. You know, and uh, you know, there's not many people. I didn't want to go to another another war. I was on reserve. I was supposed to go. So they put me in a machine shop up there. Out there. Where was that in California? In uh, Shoemaker, California. Was there near a... San Francisco? Okay. And and uh, I met the German PWs, German prisoner of war that they captured from the invasion of Normandy. They shipped them out to the machine shops out there. <laughs> there was a pilot, a German Luftwaffe. There was an automobile manufacturer that was a prisoner there, too. So I met Carl, who was the automobile manufacturer. And I met Red. He was the pilot in the, in the Luftwaffe. And we got very friendly together. What did they think? Did, what did they think of Hitler at the time? Did they think he was crazy? And they, these two fellows, they weren't in the SNS. The SNS troopers were the ones that wanted to fight for Germany. Yeah. A lot of the Luftwaffe, I mean the the rear Wehrmacht, rear rear which means the regular soldiers, mm. they didn't. A lot of them didn't want to fight. That's what the that's the attitude that we got from them. A lot of them stayed over here after. Yeah, right. I mean, they don't want to be want to be in this country. They don't want to go back to Germany. Right. Then I told Carl, he was a smart man. He made he made a crankshaft grinder for us. The grinder crankshaft for the troops. Well, anyway, I said Merry Christmas. It was Christmas time. I was out. Merry Christmas, Carl. He said, Don't you ever wish me a Merry Christmas? Why? My family's over there. Oh, we were enemies since. I wasn't his enemy. He was my. Or, yeah, I was his enemy. I should never. I didn't think. Oh, he was a nice guy. He taught me a lot about machinery. Machine shop. So, were you still in? Oh. Well, as far as the victory, um, we, you know, uh, VE v -E Day. VE -E Day? Yeah, the victory over uh, That's Europe. when Roosevelt got shot. Or not shot, Roosevelt died. On VE -E Day. Were you, uh, were you still in the military at that time? Yeah. yeah. What was your feelings? Were you joyous and stuff? I mean, not that the president died, but that the, uh, the war ended over in, in Europe? Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to be discharged, so they shipped me back to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, to the East Coast. That's where I got my release. Now, some of the units you were with, do you recall any of the units? What unit? All I remember is our unit. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. What what unit was that? What was it? It wasn't a unit, it was a... Was a the, the officer in charge of our unit was Hardy. His father was a judge in San Francisco. So we used to call him Judge Hardy. 
and he took care of the 24 of us. Well, uh, here's what I'm looking for. I didn't see it. Uh, LST 50. Yeah. So, no, you know, they have unit, division, battalion, group, or ship, you know. So. No, we didn't have anything yeah. like that. No. We uh, were there just for the, uh, for the Davit boats that we had. We had a 34-foot boat on Davits. Like the LST 50 took us across the Atlantic with into the higher France. Now, when you were uh, discharged, yeah. um, what'd you do? Were you were you married at that time? Were you no, still single? No, no, I couldn't afford anything. I come out of the service. I never heard of Plantsville or Southington, Connecticut. I just come out of the war. So I got on the train from Grand Central to go up to a New England. I was supposed to get off at Meriden. So I was sleeping. I missed Meriden. I fell asleep and I got off in Berlin. Next stop. Berlin. I just come off. Germany. <laughs> I tapped the old lady in front of me. What did he say? Where am I? What? What? Berlin, sir. Connecticut? Berlin, Connecticut. How many times are I going to tell you? So I got off in Berlin and I didn't, it was in the middle of the night. I don't know where the hell to go. So I finally got a, a, what the hell is it? A bus. Oh, no. A taxi from Berlin to Plainville. Then I told the bus driver, drop me off at Plainville. He didn't know Plainville. He knew Southington. I don't know Southington either. Because I came from White Plain from uh, Fortress in New York to join the service. We were living down in Eastport. It was confusing. But I didn't know they bought this farm up here because we couldn't get any more. My father couldn't get any groceries because the big chains took them all. So, so he, where'd your, what farm was there? What's that? There was a farm on West Street. So my Uncle, my father's brother, lived and worked in Torrington, Connecticut, told my father that there's a farm's brother in Plantsville, Connecticut. He should come up and look at it. So in 1943, they came up to look at it and put a deposit on it. So I went to the, I got off of Southington, I went to the police department. You know where the Tuma family lives? I had the address, but I don't know where West Street was. Oh, you're the son of um, Mrs. Toma. Yeah, why? I will take you there. They took me there. I went in the house. Please, you want to hear the screaming? Oh, they were all excited you coming home, huh? Yeah. Now you had... Uh... They didn't want to come home. I had the rights to collect from Unemployment 5220 Club. That's $20 a week for 52 weeks. I went I collected one twenty dollar bill. I couldn't stand that waiting in line to get what I'm looking for, a twenty dollar bill. And then those days it was a lot. So I never went back to the unemployment. Yeah, I said keep the rest of the money. So I went to uh, look for a job. My father said, Let's raise capons. I said, What's a capon, Dad? So we come from the city, I you know five miles from New York, and uh, he said, you get the, the, the roosters, you cut the testicles off, and they get fatter, and they get more meat on it, and you get more money when you sell them in the market. So I said, okay, so I signed up from the GI Bill of Rights of Yukon to, uh, to raise capons, and they uh, brought me a car back here. You were, you're welcome to come up. You were accepted. So I got in my 34 Plymouth. I got up to Vernon. I'm talking to myself, what the hell do I want to cut the testicles off of a, a rooster for? That's not what I want to do. I turned, I made a U-turn and went back to my father. I said, Dad, I, got, I, I can't do that. Well, you got to get a job. So I went looking for a machine job in a factory somewhere. So I found a cigarette factory in Southington. They were making cigarette uh, lighters and shovels. 
I went there, I said, you're looking for a setup man? I didn't know anything about machinery, just what I learned in Marinick, New York. And he says, yes, we're looking for somebody starting a dollar and a quarter an hour, but we can't hire you now. Come back in another week. I come back another week. Yeah, we can start you at 75 cents an hour. Are you interested? How'd you give it to me? You remember what the factory's name was? Yeah, Laurier Machine. Laurier Machine? Yeah, John Laurier from uh, Hyford, and they get ran it. He owned it, honey. Yeah, John Laurier. Where was that located? On Summer Street in Plantsville. So I worked there for 11 months. Well, I liked this. I ended up with 13 girls. Under me, and I uh, and I was in charge of a department with the help of tool makers that helped me get get by in the shop. They taught me a lot. My friends in the shop, and uh, I said to John, and I said, I'm going to go and open my own. So I had sixty five dollars in my pocket, and I bought a drill press, and I started my own business. Where'd you start that out of the house? Uh, out of a, in a barn, the farm that we bought. I was 20 years in the barn. Uh, and every time we needed expansion for more machinery, we'd kill the chickens, or we'd kill the goats. <laughs> Slaughter them, not kill them. <laughs> Same thing. What was the name of your company that you started? G, my initials, GMT. GMT. George Michael Tillman. A lot of people I tell today, GM Tire, that's what it stands for. Now, um, when you got out of the military, I mean, and you, you know, started your own business, yeah, uh, working on a farm for your for your dad, but, yeah. Um, now, at some point, you must must have met uh, the girl of your dreams. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, like I was going. I started in 47, I got married in 57, so it was 10, 10 years there. I wouldn't get married unless I can support a family. It's not like they do it today. No. Today, they get married, they get the electric bill, they get a divorce. Sickening. Now, how did you meet your wife? Uh, <laughs> can I say this on tape? Well, it's up to you. <laughs> I don't see. They say worse things. My father and I and my uh, uncle were going to Danielson, Connecticut, to a poker, uh, not a poker game, but to a pinochle game there. Nuts about pinochle, and they go anywhere to play a good game of pinochle. So I went along with them. So coming back after the pinochle, we were stopping in Willimantic. We he heard that the, at the Portuguese club, there's a Lebanese outing going on. All Lebanese came there. So we went there and said, no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to get back to my shop. Oh, come on, we're stopping here, son. So we stopped in there. And there's a beautiful lady. Oh, my God. She was greeting us with really white roses. And she sold me one for $2 and a half. I bought it. I was going to buy all of them. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I took the flower and walked away from her. I saw another fellow with a flower. He said, how much you pay for that flower? He said, the buck and a half. <laughs> so I went back to her. He said, you know, I got screwed before I got married. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget it. He said, what are you talking about? She says, I charged you $2 and a half, and that fellow there was a dollar and a half. He's a native of Moulin, Moulin-Mantic. <laughs> what was <an> excuse? <laughs> yeah, that was her excuse. So then on, I got her name and address, and she belonged to the St. Paul's Church in Willimantic. And I never knew they had two St. Paul's Church. They can have three, four, five. I never knew that, because I switched from Catholic to the <laughs> to Episcopalian. And uh, she said, yes, we have one in Willimantic. So we got married in her church in Willimantic. It was a big wedding. Last two weeks. Lasted two weeks? Yeah, my father carried on. We went on our honeymoon. And my father started the wedding. In the old country, they, they last for a long time. 
in the back of the shop, there was a big barn there, so he fixed it up there. We had Arabic dressing. We had a hula hula girl there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a lot of stories in my life. No, I get all, I get all discombobulated. Yeah. What was your wife's uh, name? Meta. Meta? And her maiden name? Uh, Netta Haddad. Haddad. Yeah. Now you had some children. Oh yeah, four. Four children? No, um, what were their names? They all had the GMT name, initial. Uh, Gay Michelle Tuma, that was the oldest girl. George Michael Tuma the second, that's the oldest boy. Guy Matthew Tuma. Who took over my business, and Geraldine May Tuma, who was a school teacher in Meriden Platt, and she, she teaches uh, uh, biology. That's the four. So you were, you were blessed with a good wife, a uh, great family. Good children, very clean kids. Did any of them go into the military? I mean, your, your son? My son, George. He went in? What yeah, but he, he went in. He went to Wiesbaden in Germany, mm -hmm. but it was during peacetime. Now, was he in the Army? Navy? Army. Army. He worked on the tanks. Mm -hmm. He was a welder on the tanks for the Army. Yeah, then he'd go to skiing up in the Swiss Alps. Now, as far as your, your experience in the military, you grew up pretty fast, though. Mm -hmm. Going in from high school and going to war at a young age and serving your country. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add? I mean, uh, well, if, if I was able, if it happened again, I'd go again. What do you think about the uh, the wars going on now over in Afghanistan? And I know we're out of Iraq, but we're still in Iraq, believe it or not. But um, why don't we mind our own business? Sure, help your neighbor, but not when there's a boundary of water separating us. Probably more we could do for our country as far as protecting Let's look ourselves. Over your shoulder. Yeah. Take a trip down south. Right in Southington here. Well, Mr. Tom, I, I appreciate this. Um, like I indicated, uh, this is going to be put in the Historical Society of Southington, the Central Connecticut uh, Archives for the Veterans uh, History Project, and the, uh, also the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Um, I appreciate you taking time out and uh, giving us some history of World War II and, and your family and your life. Um, we appreciate it very much, and, and we appreciate the service that you gave to our country. Thank well, you. I want to thank you for taking over and doing this thank for you. all of us. Thank you.